Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built, and this week we need to get this engine back into the Alferrari. All right, guys, welcome back. And those watching last week will have seen that um, I spent a lot of time making some clearance for the engine in the Alferrari's engine bay. Uh, basically, before it was extremely tight everywhere, and uh, when the engineer had a look at the car to get it registered for the road, one of the le legal uh, rules is it needs to have at least 10 millimeters around every single part of the engine. So. Uh, I've gone through and made those clearances now. I moved one of the engine mounts and all of the rest of it. So now there should be plenty of space. But the engine bay is a complete nightmare. It is completely filthy and uh, bare metal and I've ground things and welded stuff and just made an absolute mess of my beautiful uh, engine bay. So first job today is to get in there, give it a clean and then uh, look at uh, trying to repaint it, protect stuff and uh, yeah get it all tidied up before we put the engine back in. So first I blow off and wash the engine bay and then I've masked up and scotch brighted all the bits I'm going to paint and wax and grease remove just to get everything nice and clean and ready to repaint bit of etch primer to start with. Once that was dry, I went over with the 1K epoxy. I really like this stuff. It's nice and hard wearing and it gives a really nice, neat finish. And with it all unmasked, it's looking like a nice net engine bay again and you can't actually see any of this from the top so it doesn't really matter that it's not yellow anymore originally i was going to actually paint this all black anyway uh, so i think this looks good so now it's time to replace the front crankshaft seal and the first thing i need to do is to lock the flywheel from spinning so i can undo the crank bolt removing the crank pulley and then I like to drill some holes into the main seal and put some wood screws in there and I find that's the best way to get these things out. All right, so that's my method for getting the main seals out, rear main seals and uh, also this uh, front crankshaft seal. Um, I just drill a small hole, put a, uh, a basic sheet metal screw in there and then use them to, uh, to pull it out. You have to be very careful. You want to make sure you don't uh, damage the surface at all. So you go through, like you can see here, I've gone through the center of the, uh, the ring, and then you can just sort of work it out either side and get it off without doing some damage. So what I'm gonna do now, I've got some brake cleaner, I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna clean up around that edge, make sure it's nice and clean and tidy. Uh, then I've got some assembly lube. Um, Ferrari says to use oil, but uh, I'm gonna use assembly lube uh, on the inside only of the ring. So the outside, obviously stays fixed and you want it uh, sealed well. But the inside, this is obviously the crankshaft. It spins around, that's what this seal does. So uh, a little bit of assembly around the inside of that and uh, we'll very, very gently put it back on. So uh, let's do it. All right, so I found a bit of tube that was just the right size, which is always the best. If you can find um, a nice flat piece of uh, uh, tube, bit of PVC pipe, whatever you can, uh, and tap the uh, seal in, you can get it nice and square instead of sort of cocking it in and hitting it all the way around. You want to take your time, do it very slowly, and uh, it's not that difficult. You just need to make sure when you're uh, initially sliding it on that the inside lip doesn't fold back on itself. The inner lip on the inside here um, can very easily sort of fold under and you won't get a seal. So 
making sure you get that on and then uh, it should all go nicely. So that looks good. Let's reassemble this and then we can start getting the engine back in the car. So with the crank bolt tightened up to 196 newton meters, I'm just going to put a little bit of gold heat tape, probably redundant, but there are suspension bushings in there, and then put the engine back in. All right, engine's back in. Another one of the things that uh, the engineer brought up is that the uh, bolts I had were not quite long enough and uh, the threads weren't going through the end. So uh, yeah, I went to United and uh, uh, some longer bolts and some nylock washers. So that is a big part of it, making sure that there's, there's threads coming out of the end. All these little things that the engineer is after. So we'll hook everything up and uh, see if we can start it again. So uh, now it's time to fit the radiator again. And uh, there were lots of comments on the radiator. Obviously people who have been watching from the start were saying that I need to build a shroud for the radiator. That was already done back uh, in a uh, much earlier episode. Uh, so it's got a sealed shroud, it's sealed all the way around. Um, I'm still using these same fans. I haven't got new fans yet. Uh, and the other thing that uh, I've got on here is I've got these, uh, these rubber flaps. Um, for those who don't understand, basically the uh, the principle is when you're stopped, that's what the fans are for. So the fans are there so when you're not moving and don't get airflow, um, they're sucking air through. But once you're moving at speed, these actually become a restriction. Uh, so that is why there's these rubber flaps so that at uh, when you're stopped, the fans will be sucking the air through and they'll suck these flaps closed and uh, and it will be sucking the air through the, through the radiator. At speed, the air is uh, greater at the front than these fans can pull and they'll actually blow these open and get more airflow out through all the holes I put in behind the, uh, the flaps. Modern cars have a similar sort of uh, uh, system. So let's get this back in the car. We're back together again, so time to refill it with coolant. I've got the vacuum bleeder. Um, for those who haven't seen these things, this is fantastic. It's what uh, you need for a lot of modern cars. This car, because the radiator is actually higher than the engine uh, by quite a bit, you don't really need it. You could just fill it up and it would uh, it would bleed pretty easily. But uh, I've just taken to using it. It'll tell you if there's a, a leak. So basically you suck a vacuum into the whole system and then um, we, using that vacuum you've made, you just draw the uh, coolant into the system um, straight through using the vacuum to pull it in. Okay. 
All right. So we're all back together again. It should all be good, but uh, I just want to get up in the air, do a one final uh, nut and bolt check, make sure I've got everything right. I've topped up the coolant, I've topped up the oil. I put a little bit less oil in this time than I did previously because I was having that uh, issue, but I'm gonna be uh, very careful of watching the oil level in the uh, in the dry sump tank making sure that that's all in a in a, a nice happy spot and then we've got oil pressure and all that sort of thing there are the fail safes in the ecu already that if it doesn't have oil pressure it won't uh it, it basically will, will die so uh see what it does <laughs> and this is why we check I have a big puddle of petrol under the car, so it uh, looks like my fuel line is leaking. Yay! All right, well, I found that fuel leak and uh, it was just a loose AM fitting, so I've tightened that up. I've gone over, I've checked everything. I am reasonably happy that we're good. But before we start it, I'm gonna pull the uh, fuel pump fuse just so that we can run it and uh, crank it over, make sure that we don't, we have oil pressure and, uh, and then we can uh, actually try starting it and make sure that I haven't screwed something up. It's always stressful, always. I did forget something, the ground strap. All right, ground strap's connected. Let's try and crank it again and see if we can get oil pressure. So of course, we've got no oil pressure. Arrgh. So um, we know we've got oil. There's definitely oil in the car. There's oil on the gauge and uh, everything's connected up and that's all good. So we know we've got oil. The engine sounds like it's turning over fine. Um, the likelihood that the internal pump is gone, as I said, the engine sounds fine, and it was working before we took it out. So I think we do have oil pressure. What we have is a sensor that is not reading correctly. I did have to pull the sensor out to get the engine out. It sits below the oil filter at the back, so that if I lifted the engine up straight up, it would snap the, the uh, sensor off. So I did remove it, and I remember struggling to get the plug in, so it's probably something to do with the electrical connection. Hopefully it's not the sensor. I was pretty careful with it, and I pulled it out, and didn't uh, sort of you know, bang it around too much and drop it on the floor, so it should be okay. I'm pretty sure it's the connection, so let's get in there and Test the wiring and uh, see if we can get oil pressure. All right, there's no way to film in there, but uh, I took a picture and you can see there that the uh, that lower terminal is uh, blown open and uh, I think that's probably it. It's probably a bad connection, so I'm going to get in there and try and sort of crimp it closed a little bit uh, tighter and uh, plug it in again and we'll see if we've got oil pressure now. All right, we have oil pressure. All right, we have oil pressure again, so I'm just gonna do one last check around the car, plug in the fuel pump again, and um, we'll see if she starts. And fingers crossed, uh, now that I have plugged the hole that was on the back of the, uh, the inlet plenum, it should hopefully idle. So uh, let's give it a go. We have idle. All right, that sounds so much better. It's, it's idling at uh, 1200 RPM, which is what it's set to idle at, at um, when it's cold. And as it warms up, it drops down to sort of 950. So um, currently, that's sounding so much nicer. We've got plenty of oil pressure. For those uh, worried about the, uh, the charging, um, I didn't have the dash plugged in last time, so the alternator is working. Let's take you through now and I'll show you some of the stats. 
We're already dropping down the idle because it's warming up. So we've got 14.1 volts, so alternator is working and charging. Um, yeah, things are doing what they're supposed to do. Around the back, it's sounding quite nice. But under here, I'm not sure if the camera's picking it up, but we sound like we've got an exhaust leak somewhere, which is not a huge deal. All right, we are oil pressure, but there's far too much oil in the oil tank, so I'm gonna drain some oil out right now. And you may be asking, Jeff, how are you gonna drain oil out of the oil tank? And that is where the vacuum brake bleeder comes in. And uh, yeah, I can just snake this down into the dry sump tank and, uh, and suck out uh, a litre of oil at a time and see how it goes. So uh, let's lower that level of oil because there's far too much in there now. I sort of kept adding it when I was uh, getting low oil pressure and I think I just wasn't cranking it long enough. So let's uh, stick this in and, uh, and suck some oil out. All right, I kept sucking a little bit more oil out because um, when I wasn't getting oil pressure, I was getting a little bit paranoid that I hadn't put enough oil into the car and I added a bit more because it wasn't coming up on the dry sump tank gauge. And I really want the dry sump tank to sit about halfway on the gauge. That's how I've set the gauge up. That's roughly where I want it to sit. Anyone who's driven an air cooled 911 will know that uh, when you generally start them up, um, the oil tank level is really, really low. And then as you drive the car and it warms up, the oil um, tank level goes up. I never really understood why this is, because there's the same amount of oil in the system the whole time. Um, a really good explanation I read on uh, one of the forums of this was, if you imagine um, oil gets much thinner as it warms up. So if you imagine you're standing in a kiddie pool full of honey, and uh, you start pumping the honey out of the bath and over yourself. It's obviously gonna take a long time to uh, sort of trickle down and eventually get back in the bath again, which is what the oil's doing. But if you had the same um, kiddie pool with the same level, but with water, and you started pumping the water over yourself from the bath, obviously it's gonna run off of you quick, much more quickly, so the level is gonna be higher but there's still the same amount of honey or water in the system, and that's what the oil is doing. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to some of you. But uh, in any case, yeah, I was getting paranoid because the, I obviously don't wanna run this or even crank it over without oil, and uh, the gauge was right down the bottom, and I was sort of worried that there wasn't enough, uh, anything happening with the oil pressure and things like that. In the end, it was more than fine. I put too much oil in it, and uh, yeah, it's a matter of getting that balance right so that I don't keep, um, getting too much vapor coming back out and going back into the engine. So uh, I think I've sucked enough oil out. Let's put the bonnet back on again because I want to test my overheating theory. Now I'm not running the bash plate. Uh, I don't think I was clear last time that I do actually intend to put the bash plate back if I can with venting in it. But uh, to start with, I'm just gonna try running without it totally, see if it works, if that's the solution to my cooling, and then I can add it back with, uh, with holes in it and stuff like that and see if that still works or if that's too much of a restriction. So we'll, we'll work that out at the time. And uh, yeah, it's quite hot today. It's uh, 32 degrees, it's a reasonably warm day. Uh, what's that? I'm not sure what that's in American, but uh, like 95-ish, I think, something like that. Let's uh, see if it overheats. Fingers crossed, it doesn't. So far, so good. Uh, the engine's gradually coming up to temperature, so we'll just watch it and see what happens when the fans come on, we get up there. It's so much quieter when it's not sitting at 2200 RPM. It's just idling nicely and little bit quietly. What is that? Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Something doesn't sound good. Something sounds bad. Something sounds very bad. Oh, 
that doesn't look good. What is that? Okay. No, 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 no. Why is there a loose timing belt? No. I think I may have actually killed the engine. It was still running, it was starting to make nasty, horrible knocking noises, and it was running fine. Um, I found this on the ground, so this is my uh, link throttle control module that I obviously hadn't um, put in a safe place in um, underneath the, the plenum. <sighs> it's come down and, uh, and got tangled into something and flicked out. Let me show you what I've seen. It's not good. So looking up from underneath the engine, and I can see that this thing here was reaching over and it's, I thought something was wedged in against the timing belt and then I touched the timing belt. And it's all completely loose. That is horrific. The engine was still running when I turned it off. Um, it didn't stop. It did make some nasty noises, but that could have been this kicking around. That's me thinking positively, but I just don't know. Oh, that, is, that is horrible, horrible news because that means if the belt's loose like that, that means that valves can be hitting pistons and there could be all sorts of catastrophic damage and the engine could be absolutely toast. And it's probably because I just didn't um, put things away properly and it was just sort of dangling in the engine bay and it got dragged into the, uh, I'm not sure exactly how it happened, I'm still, I'm still reeling. Either way, It's not good. Um, just thinking now, I'm a week away from going to um, Project Supercars. I'll still be taking the car there, um, but it'll probably be just on a trailer, just rolling around again. I am just, oh, so just oh, frustrated. It's so much work to get here and we're this close to the end and now who knows what's gonna happen. I can get to the front and have a look at it with uh, just taking the radiator out and I can potentially do timing belts and stuff like that with it in there. We can see, I can look at the timing and stuff without removing the engine completely again. Oh, I just, uh, I'm... All right. Jeff's a bit frazzled. It's still very fresh. It's only been an hour or so since this happened. My only consolation is the car was still running when I turned it off. I don't understand with that timing belt how loose it is that it was running, but it was running. It's on camera. It was running. I turned it off. I don't know if I bent valves, probably, like, more than likely bent valves. I don't, I just don't know. I can't even face it at the moment. I am, I'm just, I just don't even know this, like, ah. Uh. It's okay. We'll take I mean, a break and have fresh eyes. Fresh eyes. I'm yeah. thinking about it like if I need new heads, like the bottom end should be good, I hope. It was, I said it was running. I don't know. I just don't know. So uh, I'll get stuck. I'll do something about it next week, but it may be quite expensive. It may have to sit on the sidelines for a little while. I've got the truck that I can get stuck into, which is hopefully going to be a little bit less stressful than... Then this thing, but it will get done. I will fix it somehow. Yes. We'll work it it's out. It's a spirit. Join uh, us on Patreon to try yeah, and help. help, help Join on Patreon. Help um, cover the costs. In the meantime, on happier news, yes. we have from Michael Fabby. Thank you so much for yes. seeing this. Michael Fabby from Oregon sent me through a Oregon number plate. 
um, which is going to take pride of place. And he also, uh, he's an ex um, Canuck, I think, Canadian. Oh. So he's put some uh, Canadian coins on here onto the uh, the plate. This is going to have pride of place up on the uh, the wall. Um, yeah, I love uh, these plates. And if uh, any of you are motivated to send uh, plates through, there's an address in the description. That would be uh, that would be great to uh, add up around here and sort of get a bit of uh, colour from the different places around the world. Go um, next to New Hampshire, live free or die. Yes, we've got one from uh, our friend Jesse in New yep. Hampshire up here on the wall. So, and anyway, any case, we'll uh, just to just to reiterate. So, like, subscribe again if you want to help Jeff out and his joining us on Patreon would be amazing. <laughs> and you get to see the videos day early uh, with no ads. Yeah. yeah. All right, guys. Thank you, guys. Take care, everybody. See ya. Bye. Something doesn't sound good. Something sounds bad. Something sounds very bad.